Welcome back, everyone. I'm the Bella Gamer, and we're back, baby, with the archetypes. This is a series that I really built my channel upon, and it's something that I've unfortunately had to go into a hiatus over because of the remaster. I just didn't know what archetypes would be changing and how, and, you know, I, I just didn't want to do the same work over again. But for the first time, really, since the remaster has come out, we have new archetypes all ready to go that are remaster approved. Even the Rage of Elements book, which was actually remaster approved, it didn't really have much in the way of new archetypes. So that being the case, we're back with the series. And what better archetype to start with than the were creatures? I'm sure many of you are very excited about this. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of awoos in the comments. Go ahead, go ham, enjoy it. And while you're down there, go ahead and subscribe to the channel because we have so much more coming out in Howl of the Wild. It's a crazy book filled with so many different character options, player options, and the like that you are not going to want to miss a single video. So that being the case, go ahead and subscribe and like the video so that other people get a chance to see this as the channel still is not the most prevalent, you know, Pathfinder channel out there. So, you know, it'd be great if other people got a chance to see this content as well. But let's go ahead and get into the dedication, shall we? So, the Were Creature archetype is a, a very interesting archetype, and despite what the, like, image is here for the Were Creature archetype, it's actually mostly about using your unarmed strikes that you get from being a were creature. And one of the things I really like about this particular archetype is it allows you to combine a strike with some maneuver or ability or a thing. It's a very efficient archetype and it makes your were creature feel really, really good. So let's go ahead and get to the dedication, shall we? So the dedication itself, now the requirements to get this dedication, which is a rare one, I might add. So, you know, with GM approval is you need to be either born into a lineage of true were creatures or you are afflicted with the curse of the were creature. Now, before we get into like the rest of it, I am going to point out this kind of sidebar here that talks about the what it means to be a were creature and what that means for your game and it mostly just boils down to don't be don't be trouble you know where creatures are really cool but not if they're impeding the story or making it rough for everyone to deal with your character everyone really likes this idea of the were creature that kind of loses their control during a full moon and that's a fun idea sure but you have to play with that in mind that other people need to deal with your character. And that is incredibly selfish. You want to do this if it enhances the story. And it's better if you've worked with your other players to make this something that is an aspect that everyone gets to participate in. Not just, hey guys, deal with my character. <laughs> you know, it's just something that you need to be super aware of and honestly when you take this particular archetype the assumption is you're actually gaining self-control so if we go back here to the actual dedication itself it says here that you gain the beast and were creature traits choose a were creature on uh, from the table on page 77 which we're going to get to in a moment once you've chosen this you this can't be changed you gain the toughness feats but also a weakness to silver equal to half your level you gain the chain shape action and to assume your hybrid shape and you can't voluntarily activate or dismiss chain shape uh, when you go into a full moon. So when it's full moon, you just automatically go into it. So chain shape just allows you to turn into either your hybrid shape or your animal shape, whatever that is based on whatever rare creature you are. And then you can dismiss this to turn back into a humanoid. So Overall, becoming a were creature just allows you to do those things mechanically. And this might be a feature that your GM just gives you if you're bitten by a were creature. Now, obviously, this is a level two feat. 
So this is kind of more of a thing that should be a, an intentional choice when you make your character. But even if you don't, I mean, at the point where you become bitten, you can just lean into the were creature if you think your character has the willpower and ability to kind of overcome the curse and the mindless nature of it, which is a very fun idea and something I find very interesting. Uh, there's also this little section down here at the bottom that talks about beastkin, where if you're a beastkin, you can use your unarmed attacks while in your hybrid form. From your hybrid shape in your were creature shape, I should mention. Though otherwise, the two shapes are actually considered different, which is interesting. And that's for the purpose of certain feats. So certain feats that work on your were creature hybrid form don't work in your hybrid form from beastkin and vice versa. So that's a lot of talk over just a feat that pretty much just says you get to be a were creature. But let's look at what were creatures you get to be. So starting off, we have the Werebat, which has a 10 foot land speed and a 15 foot fly speed. This is the worst shape of all of them. And that's purely for the fact that one, you'd only get the piercing bite uh, fang attack. But when you fly with your with your 15 foot fly speed, which is not a small amount, but it, it, it's not great. You have to begin and end your turn on a solid surface or you immediately fall. So as with many ways that Paizo deals with flying creatures in general, flying at early level is not real flying at all. So that being the case, your fly is more of an improved leap and not nearly as far as a leap can get sometimes. Now, well, that is definitely interesting. The wear bat itself, when you're in your hybrid form, is just bad. It's something that feels like it doesn't do anything, really. So, you know, that being the case, the wear bat, you're, you're, you just, you're slower than other, than other types of wear creatures because you have a 10 foot land speed, 15 foot fly speed. So you might as well just fly everywhere, right? There's no reason to actually walk around unless for some reason you're just not able to do so. And flying up is difficult terrain. So you already lose an extra five feet just going vertical at all, which means you don't really get to fly all that far. I, I feel like it's overly punished. I feel like the werebat speed, like the land speed, should be at least 20 if this is going to be the case. Or make the fly speed 20 and the land speed 10. Either way, just make it where it's not painful to use. I feel like werebat is just bad. But anyway, let's go and look at the werebear. So werebear gives you a 25 foot speed. You gain a jaw and a claw attack. The jaw is just a D8, while the claw attack is a D6 slashing agile, which is pretty cool. Then we have the war or werebear, which gives you a 30 foot speed, which is the fastest, one of the fastest technically. And you gain a tusk attack. It's a D8 slashing, but it has the sweep trait, making you really good at dealing with multiple enemies. Then we have the were crocodile, which gives you a 25 foot speed and a 15 foot swim speed why could we not have gotten something similar with the stupid werebat i don't know anyway the jaw attack is a d8 piercing but it has the grapple trait which you know makes a lot of sense and you can hold your breath for two hours in 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 animal or hybrid shape which is kind of cool for like a kind of like a semi-aquatic campaign then we have the were moose a new a new hybrid or a new were creature, which you can see the art for over here. They're actually kind of cool. Anyway, so the were moose gets an antler attack that is a D8 piercing and gives you the shove trait, which is not bad, makes you good for bullying enemies. Then we have the were rat. This is a particular one that makes you small if you're uh, in animal shape. You have a 25 foot speed and a jaw attack that does a D6 piercing and finesse. And a claw attack that's a D4 slashing, agile, and finesse. It's actually the only finesse of the one. So if you are playing a class that uses finesse weapons, you might want to consider the wear rat. In addition, your animal shape is small, as I said before. Next, we have the wear shark, another one that was added in this book, which really cool art over here. 
Anyway, so you get a 15 foot speed and a 25 foot uh, swim speed. Uh, faster in water than a were shark or a were crocodile, but slower on land. I I like the the differences between the two. You have a D8 piercing and the grapple trait. Now, when you're in your hybrid shape, you are considered amphibious. And when you're in your animal shape, you lose your land speed. It pretty much just gets added to you. Or it doesn't get added, but it it makes your swim speed better going up to 35 feet, which is pretty cool. And you gain the aquatic trait, which allows you to breathe underwater. So Rare Shark is really good if you're playing in a campaign that goes around a lot of water. Because honestly... On land, yeah, you're a little slow, but like you get some really cool stuff. Next up is the Wear Tiger, gives you a 25 foot land speed, a jaw attack that's a D8 piercing, and a claw attack that's a D6 slashing that has the agile trait, similar to the Wear Bear. And then finally, we have the Wear Wolf, the, the Werewolf itself, which gives you a 30 foot speed and just a jaw attack of a D8 piercing. That gives you trip. Now, I'm a little conflicted because the werewolf, like their claws are supposed to be really good. So like the actual werewolf, I'm surprised doesn't have the claw attack, but it does have a really good jaw attack that gives trip. So, you know, I, I think that this is generally okay. I think the werewolf, I mean, trip is very powerful in Pathfinder 2E, so... I think it's worth the trade, even though you don't get the aesthetic of the claws. But if you go beastkin, you could potentially have claws anyway. So something to keep to consider if being a wear creature is actually what you want to play. In addition, each of these particular wear creature types will get their own unique feats in the uh, entire archetype altogether. So that being the case. Which wear creature you choose actually has more ramifications other than these base stats, which I think is really cool. So next up, let's go ahead and take a look at the animal fleetness. So animal fleetness is really cool. So I we saw it before, but just so you know, I'll explain it aloud. So when you're in your hybrid shape, you essentially get to use all your equipment from being a humanoid creature, very typically. So the, the benefit is, is you get a lot of the same features that your animal shape does with the ability of opposable thumbs, which is pretty cool. But when you go into your animal form, you lose the ability to wield weapon shields or held items, though you do get to keep your armor, which is kind of cool, and you can't use manipulate actions. So but, but being an animal shape seems to be just inherently worse as you don't really gain all too much and you just lose out functionality that you would have had before. Well, animal fleetness changes that. So what it does is while you're in your animal shape, your speeds that it's granted to you increase by 10 feet. Now, if you're going werebat, this is kind of necessary if you want to use the flight like at all. So that being the case, if you're going werebat, please take Animal Fleetness. You'll thank me later. They they, it, they make it much more worth it. And this is really good. I like the idea of your animal shape being more of like a travel shape. So you can do a lot of really cool things with it. And for like the crocodile or the, the were shark, you also get to be faster in the water, which is really cool. So that being the case, Animal Fleetness is an insanely good feat. Next up, we have a beastkin resilience. This means that you are you have to be a beastkin versatile heritage in order to get access to this one. In a century, you just lose your silver weakness, so you just become a a beastkin who has rare creature abilities, which I think is pretty cool and definitely a way you can kind of make a true rare creature who is not cursed as necessarily but instead is like from the true lineage of true wear creatures, which I think is really cool. So Beastkin Resilience is really good, though. To be fair, I would prefer to keep the silver weakness. I like weaknesses in characters. It's something that's very good for roleplay purposes. It makes your character just more interesting. So it's up to you what you prefer. And like I said, the Beastkin, like true wear creature idea is still really valid. I just, I would prefer to keep the the weakness myself is i just think it makes my character more interesting next up is feral senses this allows you to when you're in your hybrid or animal shapes you gain a low low light vision and an imprecise sense 
with a range of 30 feet. It does say scent, not scents, as, as mentioned several times in this book even. So it, your creature can smell really good up to a range of 30 feet. So pretty good. This one does kind of lead to some further feats. So it's something I definitely would recommend taking, especially if you're a were shark, which we'll get to here in just a bit. Next up, we have Antler Rush. So at level six, you, we get access to the six level feats, and each of these are particular, well, most of them anyway, are particular to a specific type of were creature. So this is where you're going to really want to tune in to see what were creature has a feat that you like best. So Antler Rush is two actions, and it has the flourish trait. Now, you must be in your moose hybrid shape or, or animal shape. And you stride twice. At the end of your movement within your antlers reach of an enemy, you can disarm, shove, or strike with your antlers. I like the disarm part. I think that's very fun. You just, you run up like you're about to charge into someone, and then you're just like, ha, ha, definitely remove their weapon from their hand. Something that they wouldn't expect. And if you're like a swashbuckler swashbuckler moose were creature is genuinely really strong so you know that's really fun but you know it, it it's an action that allows you to stride twice and strike with just two actions so a really good initiating ability and it allows you to do some really fun things as well i actually really like antler rush next up we have bear hug and the funny thing about this one is it completely so in a table talk and we actually have table talk later today so if you're all interested in hearing more about the book before the videos come out check us out at 4 p.m pacific standard time but bear hug represents the asymmetrical design necessary for role role playing games as bear hug what it allows you to do is uh with the requirement that you're in your bear or hybrid shape and your last action was a successful claw strike this one allows you to spend two actions to make another claw strike at, you know, your multi-attack penalty. And if the strike hits, the creature is then automatically grabbed until the end of your next turn, or unless you move or your target escapes. Pathfinder has removed from many enemies in the game the auto-grab maneuvers. Many of them now require you to still make an athletics check, even though it's not at a greater penalty due to the attack trait. So Bear Hug just breaks that for the players, so the players get to do it cool. And I find it funny because it's it's definitely that asymmetrical player favoring side. So, you know, just know that Paizo wants the players to have fun. So whenever you make any adjudications in a game, just make sure it's player leaning because that seems to be Paizo's intent. Next up, we have Death Roll for guess what? The Wear Crocodile. Now you must be in your crocodile or hybrid shape and you have a creature currently grabbed. So what you do is you attempt to strike on a creature that is currently grabbed with a plus two circumstance bonus if you're in the water. So if you're in the water, it's actually, you become kind of like a pseudo fighter by getting a plus two, which is pretty good. Now if the strike hits, you knock the creature prone. If it misses, they escape, escape your grab. So this is a bit of a gamble, but... If you knock a creature prone while you're grabbing them, it's insanely powerful. And if you're in water, you become like a fighter. So that being the case, this is really, really good. You can knock a creature prone and then they need to escape in order to even then stand up wasting two actions just to get back on their feet, which is insanely powerful. And if they don't, then they're just prone and probably drowning if you're in the water. So yeah, Death Roll is insanely good. I think this is a really solid feat. Next up is Echolocation with the Werebat. Now, when you seek, when you have this feat, you can use hearing as a precise sense with a range of 40 feet until the start of your next turn. You can also use this sense when you search. So this is actually a really, really good feat, despite my misgivings with the Werebat. And I'll make special mention, you don't need to be currently in your hybrid or animal shapes. So just as your base humanoid, you actually can get a, per a precise hearing sense of a range of 40 feet when you use the seek action. Why this is good is because if you use a seek action to detect essentially an invisible creature, they're no longer invisible to you. They're no longer even concealed. 
as it is vision based. Now, this is kind of a weird thing with the rules in general, because the rules always take into consideration that sight is the only precise sense that a character has. So invisibility will say that you're you're hidden, yada, yada, yada. They'll say specifically you're hidden, but that's because it, it assumes that you are currently like the only things that can perceive you can only perceive you with vision like most of the time if you're invisible this precise sense actually allows you to perceive an invisible creature as if they're just out in the open to you making them no longer even concealed to you which is very very powerful so echolocation is genuinely really good and you don't even need to be in your hybrid shape so honestly if this is all you do if you just take wear creature a level four feet an echo location and that's all you do with the where creature archetype that's a pretty solid boon honestly for any class that especially a martial class so echo location is really good and probably if you're using the free archetype rule and you went where about anyway definitely i recommend taking it next up we have fearful symmetry now this is a very strange feat because i don't know where symmetry is involved but this needs to be you. Uh, this is for the wear tiger, and you must be in your hybrid or tiger shape. And your last action was a critical success with your unarmed attack, which is either the jaws or claw attack. Now, when you do so, all enemies within 30 feet of the creature you critically strike must make a will save against your class DC. Enemies that fail their saves become frightened one and are fascinated with you for a round. Your hostile actions don't end this fascination but those from your allies do. Regardless of the save, the enemy then becomes immune for an hour. This is pretty good. It's a it's an interesting way to enhance the critical effect, essentially, of your wear tiger abilities. I don't like this one in comparison to a lot of the other feats because it just feels like it has a lot more steps to do a lot of the just not anything super fascinating. And there's actually a feat later that kind of makes this one bad. So I don't know. I, I, this is just something that I I I like because it enhances a, a crit kind of, even though it's an action to activate it. But there's just better feats in the game for this. So Wear Tiger kind of gets a little screwed. So if you went Wear Tiger, I'm I'm sorry. All right, we're up to Wear Shark's feeding frenzy. So you need to be Wear Shark, but you don't need to be in your hybrid or animal shapes to make use of this. Though, I guess actually, no, you actually you do, which is very weird for the prerequisite part, but whatever. So essentially, when you critically hit with your jaw strike from the wear creature dedication, your target takes a D4 persistent bleed damage and gains a plus one circumstance bonus to jaw strikes against the target until the end of your turn. If you have the scent, if you have scent as a special sense, which you can pick up with an earlier feat, it's precise sense with this is doubled its normal range when locating a creature taking persistent bleed damage so this doubles your range so that would be like 60 feet and that's really good and the the reason why i like this one in comparison to wear tigers is this one it's just you crit the target starts bleeding that's it a pretty solid effect wear tigers like you do it they need to make a save against your class dc and then they're just immune for an hour whether they get frightened or not which just feels bad. Wear Tiger would be better if it just made all enemies within 30 feet frightened and then they're immune to the effect for an hour. I think that would be fine. I think that'd be balanced, especially when compared to like Feeding Frenzy here. But I don't know. Anyway, so Feeding Frenzy is really good. Just adding a, an extra persistent bleed damage when you crit someone is really good. And you get a plus one circumstance bonus to your jaw strikes against that creature until the end of your turn. So... Yeah, I mean, it makes your next hit, which is less likely to hit, a little bit more likely to hit. Feeding Frenzy is just good. All right, we have a neutral level six feet here, Pack Attack. Yeah, you get the monster feature. It's pretty cool. So when you're fighting an enemy that is adjacent to two of your allies, you sh your strike deals an additional D4 precision damage, which is really good. I like Pack Attack. I think it's really, really good. If you have a very martial heavy team, there's absolutely no reason why you should take Pack Attack. And if you're playing a wear tiger, you probably should just take pack attack rather than the wear tiger one. Sorry, but that's just kind of how the dice roll, I guess. All right, here's the rat, the wear uh, rat one. So we have plague rat. This is a curse and disease. 
for all intents and purposes for any creature resistances. So when you hit a creature and deal damage with your jaw strike as your where your hybrid or rat shapes, the creatures curse until the start of your next turn. Whenever they would regain hit points during that time, they must make a fort save against your against your class or spell DC, whichever is higher. And if they succeed, nothing really changes. But if they fail, they only get half the normal amount of hit points. And if they crit fail, they get no hit points. I like were rats too in comparison to like were tiger because again. It's just when you make a jaw strike, and this one is just when you hit. So it's not even when you crit. The creature is just cursed until the start of your next turn. So where rats just make it harder to heal, which is very handy in a lot of different situations. So plague rat is really, really good. We're up to the war bear, or war bear, were bear now, which with rushing boar, actually a pretty good feat. It's a reaction. That has emotional and mental traits, but this is mostly for you. But anyway, so you must be in your boar or hybrid shape, and an attack from a creature that isn't adjacent to you damages you. So when you're damaged by a strike, and typically a range strike, though it could be from a reach weapon as well, you stride in a straight line towards the targeting creature as a reaction. It's really good if you're a class that doesn't have any reactions, or you're just not in a range to use any of your reactions natively so that being the case rushing boar is very solid it just allows you to get close to enemies that are either ranged or who are a reach type enemy much more easily as a reaction i it's not bad honestly all right moving on to the level eight feats we have cornered animal actually a really good one so whenever you're flanked by two different creatures you and you can use two actions to strike both of them at a minus two penalty if the unarmed weapon is not agile. So if you're using an agile weapon, you can attack both enemies that are flanking you at no increased multi-attack penalty, which is really good. And even if you're if you're using a strike that isn't a agile weapon, a minus two to both is really not that bad. I mean, it makes your first strike less likely to crit, but it makes your second hit much more likely to hit, which I think is very fair. This is a really good action because it gives you multi-attack penalty efficiency for essentially making two strikes against enemies around you. Plus, if you're a boar, you have the sweep trait, which makes hitting both of them actually plus one easier, meaning this is actually only a minus one for both of the attacks, which is really good. So... Technically, a, a, a hidden werebear for a werebear feat mixed in here that technically any of the were creatures could use. So, cornered animal is really good. Feral mending. This is an interesting one. You can use this one once per hour, and you can only do this if you weren't afflicted with the were creature curse. So, if you are a true were creature, which there's no special denomination for this other than the fact that I guess. Whether your your character started off as a were creature, probably a beast can into were creature, you you just can't have gotten the curse from somewhere else, which is very interesting. So once per hour, when you use the chain shape action, you uh, or when your previous action was the chain shape action, you can heal your wounds with another action, giving you a d6 hit points for every two levels you have. I I find the minimum one d6 here really silly because you can't pick this feat up to level eight. So there will never be an opportunity for the minimum 1d6. But when you pick this feat up anyway, it's 4d6. So 4d6 HP as an action, just part of changing, can make any character you're playing just that much tankier. So Feral Mending is really good, and it's something you can do every hour. So in a dungeon crawl specifically, this can be very important for getting you through that dungeon. So definitely not one odd pass up. If you're a true were creature, I suppose. Next up, we have terrifying transformation. And now this one, I have some gripes with because it makes no sense name wise. Now this one is specifically if you are turned into a were creature through the curse of the were creature. So this one cannot be taken by true were creatures, which is fascinating. But essentially what happens is it talks about your flesh tears and warp as you transform. Uh, the no part of this particular feat makes you transform, which is bizarre. 
So attempt int intimidation checks to demoralize each enemy within 30 feet. This demoralizes lose the auditory trait and gains the visual trait, and you don't take a penalty for creatures who don't understand your, your language. Regardless of the result of your checks, each creature is tempor temporarily immune to terrifying transformation for one minute. Now, it says attempt intimidation checks to demoralize each enemy, but demoralize itself states that regardless of the save, the targets are immune to demoralize for 10 minutes. So I think this feat was written in a very poor way that seems like it just ignores a lot of the ideas behind the behind the game. And also just the feat doesn't make sense because no part of it makes you transform. This is just a poorly written feat, plain and simple. The the feat's name and, and, and what the flavor text is is nothing related to how it actually works. And it doesn't even really I mean, what's it's a good feat in the sense that it gives you the ability to use demoralize a, a, in an area. That's really good. That's a decent effect. It's just this just feels like it was written by someone who didn't understand the game. I don't know because it says right here, attempt intimidation checks to demoralize, which is a specific action. Each enemy within 30 feet, this demoralize loses the auditory trait and gains the visual trait. So this is a demoralized action. So regardless of what happens, they're immune to further demoralizing for 10 minutes. It doesn't even matter if you would gain access to terrifying transformation again, because they're still immune to being demoralized. And there's no transformation in here. I, I don't know. I would turn terrifying transformation. What I would do to make it more interesting is I would just, when you use chain shape once per 10 minutes, you can demoralize all enemies within 30 feet of you. That's what I would do personally. Terrifying transformation just, it feels really weird. I like the feat. I think that a single action area demoralize is powerful and is something that is good. I just, I'm left perplexed after reading this feat. So it's a good feat. I, I guess that's all I can really say. All right, next up we have You Don't Smell Right. This is a weird feat. It Essentially what it does, well, one, you gain imprecise sense with a range of 30 feet, and this should be scent, actually, or extend the range of your sense by 30 feet. So, yeah, this is actually really, really good on Were Shark because it it doubles doubles your 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 ability to smell ranges. So it allows you to smell creatures who are bleeding within 120 feet. Pretty solid. Uh, when a creature that's transformed into another form or impersonating a specific creature passes within range of your scent ability, the GM rolls a secret perception check. Yada, yada, yada. I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Essentially, you you can detect people who are transformed or who are impersonating a, a different creature in some way. So you can detect creatures who are transformed much more easily. The, uh, you get free perception checks on creatures who just walk into your range. And when you're using the seek action specifically, you get a plus two circumstance bonus if this perception check would determine if a creature is disguised or not. So not bad. I don't know if I'd use an archetype feat for something like this personally. I would if I was a were shark because getting the extended smell range just sounds like a really good idea. Enhancing an effect you already kind of get. But for most other were creatures, I, I don't know if I necessarily would. But, I mean, it can make any imprecise scent that you would have from an earlier feat just 30 feet longer, which can be really good. So, I would take this more for the enhanced smell range and the ability to detect other transformed creatures. But, depending on the kind of campaign you are, or maybe if you're like in Ustalav or something, a region known for having all kinds of like undead and hidden, hidden supernatural creatures, this might be a lot better. So, yeah, a pretty okay feat overall. Next up, we have a Dire Growth. This is a two-action feat, and it's a level 10 feat. Now, your animal shape is not small, is the only prerequisite. So, sorry for were creature or for were rat specifically, you don't get the ability to use Dire Growth. So, essentially what it does is when you change shape into your animal shape, you gain the effects of enlarge. Again, give me more reasons to use animal shape. 
I want to use animal shape. Please make animal shape good for me. So this makes your animal shape specifically large or enlarged, which is good. Increases your damage. I think it makes you clumsy and it gives you reach. A really cool ability, and you can do this in a lot of really cool scenes. And some of the were creatures are really cool. Like the shark, you become like a megalodon, like a smaller me me megalodon, but a really big shark, which I think is really cool. So dire growth is actually really cool. And it makes your were creature form really good. I mean, if you're already using, you know, your unarmed strikes as your primary damage source, you know, there's honestly no reason not to just fight in your, your B shape, unless you're like a shark and on land, but still, it's it's pretty good. Next up, we have Feral Lunge. Now, this requires that your were creature is a shape that gives you either the fangs or jaws on arm to attack, which is quite a good number of them. So this can be used by a lot of the were creatures. As a singular action, you can stride up to 10 feet and make a jaw strike on at the end of your movement. This is a really good, efficient action that allows you to stride only 10 feet and strike, but still pretty good. I mean, if you're not going to do anything else. Now, this does have the flourish trait. So you do need to be careful if you have any other flourish actions to worry about, but a really efficient action. And if you began the turn hidden or began the, the movement hidden, you stay hidden until the movement is done, meaning that you get to keep the enemy off guard, even if you move out into the open, which is really cool. And if you have any other types of speeds, like a swim speed, fly speed, uh, it doesn't mention burrow because none of them can burrow. So I guess good writing there. Uh, it can be used with those as well. So Pharaoh Lunge is, in my opinion, really good if you're close enough for it to matter. And hey, if you are in your enlarged beast shape, for instance, then you have Reach, which can make this even better. It makes enemy, more enemies essentially in range of your strikes, which is really cool. So Pharaoh Lunge is very, very solid. Next up, we have Feral Scramble. This is a very weird feat, but I guess it's very useful. So for two actions, essentially, you climb up to your land speed, and then you can make a claw strike at any point during this movement. After you finish the movement, you need to make an athletics check, and this athletics check is mostly to see if you either stay stuck on the wall climbing, or you slide down 60 feet or to the ground without taking damage. This does allow you to climb and strike at the same time, which is pretty good. And this does make some a lot of combat situations actually a lot better. There's a there's a you know like an archer guy up on a wall. You can climb that wall and reach up and, and claw him from there. And if you have a really good athletics, this is probably not a big deal, and you'll just stay on the wall and then you can like kip up or pull yourself up onto the ledge or something like that. Feral Scrambles is very interesting, and I'm always for something that allows climbing to be easier because, let's all face it, climbing is a hassle in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, even though that's just something that a players want to do very often. So Feral Scramble, honestly, not that bad. Would I take it as a, a level 10 feat for this archetype? Maybe not, but I don't know. It might be useful in, in some situations, so it's definitely not bad to have. I, I think it's pretty okay. All right, next up we have Feral Toss. Not a friendly version of tossing that we've been seeing in some other parts of this book, but you need to be a were creature with an animal shape that grants you an antler, horn, or tusk unarmed attack, which is not many, but there are a good number of were creatures that have these anyway. Now, you strike, you use two actions and you strike with your, your whatever horn, tusk, or antler. If you hit and damage the creature, you automatically push them five feet from you or 10 feet on a critical hit. This is forced movement. Now, this is not actually a shove, so you can't follow them. And nothing that affects shove uh, affects this particular action. But this is essentially just a, a shove that you don't need to make an athletics check to make, which makes it pretty interesting. I think Feral Toss is pretty solid overall. Five feet might not be a lot, but for a bully build, this can be a really good ability. So. Yeah, another pretty okay one. This is also a flourish, so something to keep in mind. Touch of Lunacy. This is a weird one. Now, this is a curse effect that happens when you crit. And from what I'm reading here, it doesn't replace your critical effects. So, yeah, so whenever you crit effect with a unarmed strike 
from your where creature archetype so this is either as your hybrid or animal shapes the target must attempt a fortitude save against your cla your class dc or spell dc whichever is higher and or become clumsy too until the beginning of your next turn as their bones elongate and form warps on a crit fail the target is also clumsy one for a minute as the transformation li lingers so you can claw someone or bite someone or something and they begin like a werewolf transformation and it was kind of mentioned in the part that i showed earlier but technically your were creature bite doesn't have to be contagious that it can spread to other people so this is very weird now if it does it, like is contagious this is just like an immediate version of the transformation which is very creepy very body horror-y I like this feat just because, it, again, when you critical, you can also just screw someone over by making them start transforming and, and making them clumsy, which does reduce their AC. So a very solid ability overall. I think it's very cool. It's just, it's a little gross. It's a little body horror-y. So, you know, use at your own peril if you're not into body horror. Pouncing Transformation is next. It's a level 12 feat. And it's another flourish, so there's lots of flourishes we're finding here in the archetype. But it's really cool. So you either use an action to transform, or you dismiss... Uh, so you use this action. You either change shape into either your hybrid or animal shapes, or you dismiss back to your humanoid shape, and then you stride. So this essentially makes your, spr your stride very easy. Now, this can only be used if you have a were creature that has only a land speed so sorry where about sorry where shark sorry where crocodile you guys can't get can this can't get this one but a lot of the other ones can anyway so you stride and if any creatures adjacent to you at the end of this particular movement they're off guard to you until the end of your turn and then they're immune to this for an hour which doesn't matter they're gonna probably die anyway so yeah a really good initiation tool you run into them you you Tr transform and now they're off guard to you now you can't use any of your other flourishes but i'm sure you can just mess them up normally and that will be fine so pouncing transformation i think is actually really really good very action efficient and an insanely powerful initiation tool shared tide now this is great for any animal shape that includes a swim speed so for where crocodile and where shark but essentially you spend two actions and move twice your speed any ally you pass within 30 feet of during this movement gains your swim speed until the beginning of your next turn. This is, is insanely handy a feature if you're doing any kind of underwater sections or any under like water based based campaigns where people aren't picking up swim speeds for some reason. So sheer tide can be really, really good, but it's, you know, particular to swimming specifically. So you have to take it based on how much swimming is going to be in your particular campaign. But honestly, I really like this one. It's a good Another good initiation tool, and it can help your entire team, which makes it even better. Next up is Undying Beast, a very interesting one. So if a non-silver attack reduces you to zero hit points and you don't outright die to, due to either having a high dying value or a death effect, you immediately stabilize. You gain the wounded condition as normal, but yeah. So if they don't execute you, you just don't die unless the damage is from silver which is pretty cool. Very niche. I wouldn't necessarily select this feat particularly, but depending on what your level 12 features might be, it's not a bad one for sure. Like if you're a wear bat, I guess. Oh no, actually they get the one. Yeah, so I don't know. I think this one's okay. It's just, I, I'm not a big fan of feats that are reliant on your character going down. But if your character is prone to going down a lot in combat anyway, Maybe this is a good one because it might just save your character's life. I don't know. So Undying Beast is another pretty okay feat. Except we have Wings of the Moon. This is for werebat specifically unless they re release more were creatures. So it requires that your animal shape has a fly speed. And now you can just fly. You can just fly normal. So now you don't need to immediately land after using a fly action. You can stay aloft letting you fly bigger distances. This is really good, and if you're a werebat with the enhanced speed, now you can just fly at a 25-foot movement speed, which is very solid. So Wings of the Moon, 
if you're a wear bat is a hundred percent must take if you're not taking this as a wear bat you're dumb what can i say Next up, our level 14 feats. We have Scarred Hide, a pretty good one. Uh, when you're in your hybrid or animal shapes, you gain a resistance to non-silver slashing damage equal to half your level. Honestly, being resistant to one of the core physical damage types is never really a bad thing. So Scarred Hide is insanely good. It's only against slashing, so not against piercing or bludgeoning, so something to keep in mind. But I definitely think it's worth it. You know, as long as you're staying away from silver, because silver just completely negates this. But, you know, you have to know you're a aware creature and be prepared for you to be aware to a aware creature. So Scarred Hide is going to be usually beneficial to you. Our other level 14 V is Rapid Hybridization. This is a free action when you roll initiative. It just lets you transform using chain shape, though this one is only to chain shape into your hybrid shape not into your animal shape specifically, which I find is strange. I don't know why they would necessarily prevent animal shape, especially if you go the enlarged, fast animal shape route, which makes your animal shape actually probably more dangerous than your hybrid shape more often than not. So yeah, if you're going that route, if you're going the pure beast route, you're probably not going to want to take rapid hybridization as it is just not going to benefit you really anyway. But if that's not the route you're taking and you're using your weapons or whatever it normally, then this is just going to be a really good feat and it just saves you an action, which I think is very solid. So rapid hybridization is mostly a good feat. All right. And our final feat here for the wear creature archetype. Thank you all so much for watching this video up until this point. I know this is another long one and there's going to be some other similarly long ones here in the archetype list. But we have Force of Nature. So this is a, a pretty simple one, honestly. When you're in your hy hybrid or animal shape, you gain fast healing five. If you take damage from a silver weapon, though, this becomes deactivated until the end of your next turn. So yeah, level 16, fast healing five. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty solid. I don't see a reason not to take this more often than not. So yeah, Force of Nature is really solid. And hey, that's it for the wear creature video. I know this video has gone a little bit long. I, I've been recording for about 50 minutes. It's probably going to be pretty close to 50 minutes by the time I'm done. I, I think I was pretty concise and to the point most of this video. But yeah, the wear creature archetype is really, really good. It does so many things well. It's very combat orientated, which I really like. And as well, it make it it pertains to a type of play style a lot of people have a lot of people want to be a woo be a wear creature all the time and so you know this is for them this is for people who want to do it now they do have to do a lot of writing around wear creatures because wear creatures historically have never been player characters once you're affected by the wear creature curse you just leave the game and become an enemy essentially so this is used best with the best intent. You're not going to be as good, really, as a normal wear creature, but you get to be a, a wear creature who is also a class, which will inherently just make you stronger. So you have to take that power into consideration. And I think wear creature is very solid. It's not broken. It's rare because of the... The implications of wear creatures, really, but honestly, nothing here really screams at me as being particularly overpowered. You, as you heard, most of the time I said the feats were good or okay, but I do like this archetype a lot, and I'm sure a lot of people out there are very excited for it. So that's gonna be it for me. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned. More of how the wild is coming out in the days to come i'm gonna be doing a video pretty much every day until the release on street date which is the 22nd so if you want weeks worth of content available i recommend subscribing and liking the video so other people get a chance to see this as well anyway thank you all so much for watching good luck with your games leave the bad luck to me and uh enjoy being a wear creature bye <laughs>